Let's read from Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. The word of the Lord from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. She had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, If I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped, and the and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask, Who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, Your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Halitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. I love this story, and I know Dan mentioned that last week um, as he got up to preach. He was all excited about chapter 5 until he realized that I gave him the first half of it. Because this is a remarkable story. It's an amazing story. You can't read this. You know, it says that the crowd was amazed. I can't read this, and every time I'm amazed at what happens in this story. I'm amazed at the details that surround it. So I want to talk today about these two daughters because on the one hand, we have the daughter of Jairus, right? And he comes, to her, he comes to Jesus so that she can be healed. And then we have this woman who's bleeding. We don't know how old she is, but we know that it's been going on for 12 years. The age of Jairus' daughter. And Jesus calls her daughter. So we have this story here, this kind of sandwich that, Jesus, that Mark has given us. <clears throat> the two daughters. I want to talk about fear and faith to begin with. There's a lot to love in the story uh, in this moment. One of the many aspects that I enjoy every time that I read it is both the fear and the faith that, that's depicted in these major characters, in Jairus and in this woman who has been bleeding. Imagine that you're Jairus for a moment with me, okay? You're successful, you're successful, you have a lot of authority, right? In your town, you're a synagogue leader. You help in, in running that local synagogue. And while we may not know everything that goes along with that, you're, you're important, right? You have to think about, you live in a small town, right? Maybe you have a couple hundred people. Everybody knows you. And you are literally one of the leaders of the most important focal point of that town. This synagogue is where everybody comes to worship every Saturday. 
You are important. You are successful. You've got everything you want in that town. You help run that town. You've got a wonderful family, right? Probably a loving wife. As part of that family, you have a beautiful daughter, an amazing child that you've watched grow for 12 years. And every day has been amazing to watch that child grow. And now, now that she's 12, she's actually a woman in your context, right? Because you're Jewish. So she's, she's had her bat mitzvah. It's exciting, right? She's coming into womanhood, into adulthood, where probably in a few years, you're going to be preparing to find a spouse for her and with her so that she can be married off into another good family. And all of this, every detail about your life makes you happy. You can't imagine having a better life than what you have right now. So you're excited. You're excited as you watch your daughter because you know what the future has in store. And then your daughter gets sick. You don't worry at first because sicknesses go away, right? You take remedies. You have doctors around that you can reach out to. You're an important person. So you get the best doctor you can from the surrounding area. You get them to come to your town and take care of your daughter. And she gets better, right? But her symptoms, her symptoms get worse. She doesn't get better. They're not concerning at first, but now, after time, they grow. And so there begins to be a little bit of concern in you as the sickness has not gone away. It persists no matter what you do. She's unable to get over this sickness that she has. So you don't just grab the best doctor you can. You start grabbing any doctor that you can. Right? You go looking around for any other doctor who might know what's going on with your daughter so that you can treat her and make her well. Suddenly, her sickness becomes so bad, her illness is so dire that it potentially borders on death for her. So now you're not just desperate for a doctor, you're desperate for a miracle. You don't have many places to turn. You've tried prayer, right? Prayer hasn't done anything for you yet, at least not seemingly. So what do you do? Who's a miracle worker that you can find to do something like this who isn't just a snake oil salesman, but is real and true? Let me remember, I've heard some stories about this guy, this miracle worker wandering around doing some really strange things. So people have come back to your synagogue, right? And as you've been teaching them and working with them, they told you these stories about this guy named Jesus whom you've never met, but they seem to like him. He seems to be getting on pretty well with the people out there, but you don't know him yet. They come back talking about this guy, whispering stories about what he's done and how great he is. So... There's a little bit of excitement, maybe maybe hope. As you think about confronting this person to come see your daughter, but you're scared. How can you, a self-respecting synagogue leader, turn to a guy that you're not even certain is working by the Lord's power? Right? Some of the scribes and the Pharisees are even saying, He's probably working by the power of Satan. How can you go to him? What is he going to do for you? And if he does anything, how do you know it's going to make her better? If he is working by the power of Satan, maybe she's going to get worse. Maybe instead of doing something good for her, he's going to do something nefarious. And then there are the Romans to worry about. Not just your own people, but the Romans. If Jesus continues along this path, you know the Romans are coming for him. He's going to attract their attention. He's got these great crowds following him. You've heard that. The Romans are going to come. Do you really want to be a part of bringing the Romans down on your town? Do you really, really want to be a part of this guy's story? Or do 
be better just to keep your distance. You might get arrested along with him. Maybe they're going to think you're a follower of his when all you did was hope to show up for a miracle. But who are you kidding? This is your child we're talking about. What wouldn't you do to help heal your child? She deserves whatever it takes, and so you go. Why worry about political danger or religious controversy when your child is dying? It begins to put us in the mindset of Jairus and all the things that he might have been thinking about. He thought about approaching this guy Jesus, whom he doesn't know and has no idea whether what's about to happen is going to work or not. Now let's imagine for a moment being this unnamed bleeding woman. You have no family, or at least your family doesn't want much to do with you because you're unclean, right? You're not supposed to be around people, and so people keep their distance. Maybe you've got a family, but for all these years, they've assumed there's no cure for you because you've gone to doctor after doctor, after doctor, after doctor, you've spent all the family wealth, all the money that you have on finding a cure. You can't be cured. There's no hope for you. Right? And so at this point, it's not just that you're bleeding. It's that clearly you sinned so big in your life that God is punishing you and you deserve what you're getting right now. No, you're unclean and you deserve to be alone for 12 years. So instead of 12 years of joy and excitement like Jairus has had watching his daughter grow, you've had 12 years of hardship and loneliness. You don't remember anymore what it's like not to be sick. You can't remember a time when you weren't bleeding. It's been so long at this point. You can't remember the last time that somebody other than a doctor actually touched you and wanted to be around you. You've forgotten what it feels like to hug somebody kiss someone. You've sought medical help from everybody you can think of. You've walked from town to town seeking assistance and help, and nobody, nobody can help you. So you're at the end. What do you do? You remember the name of a miracle worker. You've heard stories those people who have gone out to witness his great deeds. Now you've heard that he's heading your way, or at least in your area. So a spark of hope is there. You don't believe anymore that, that God is actually going to heal you. You're, you're just desperate. You're trying anything, anything to get well. So your hope isn't in this miracle worker, but rather in the robe that he's wearing. If I just touch his robe, if I can get a hold of that, if I can touch the robe, then I'll be healed. These two stories have almost nothing in common. Prominent Jewish man who's not sick, an untouchable woman who is sick. And yet the same thing drives both of these people. They both seek help and relief from the same person. And what drives them to Jesus is fear. Jairus is afraid for his daughter. He's afraid for her, for her life. He's afraid of what it's going to feel like if he has to live and she's not alive. This unnamed, untouchable potentially unloved woman is just afraid of being alive anymore, is afraid of having to continue to live in the state that she's in. So both stories are about fear, but they're also about faith. And they're both about how Jesus can take a person from fear to faith. How only Jesus is able to transport us from the most debilitating feelings that we have. The things that cripple us in fear. That he can take us from that. Only Jesus can do that. And transport us to faith. 
Show us a better way to live and relieve us of our pain and suffering. Both Jairus and this woman knew the, the proper posture. Whenever you come up to, to somebody like Jesus, you fall down at their feet. They both do that. We see them both fall at his feet. And it was huge that Jairus would do something like that. You're a leader of your town. Don't bow to somebody like this. But Jairus knew that he needed to communicate to Jesus in this moment you are more important than I am. Bowing, falling at his feet, communicated, communicated that. And then only after Jesus stopped this procession as he's headed to to heal Jairus' daughter, he inquires who touched him, and then the woman falls at his feet. Maybe perhaps she felt there's only one way to get on his good side at this moment. I better get down, let him know that he's better than I am. Because if you look at the story and the context of her healing, she seems to have actually placed her faith not in Jesus, but in his robe, in his cloak, in his garment that he's wearing. Not in Jesus himself. And this wasn't an uncommon, an uncommon practice in the ancient world. There was a, a, a great mystery, mystery around, around divine objects, right? That there were certain things that you could take hold of, and they would give you some sort of power, right? That there was power infused into these objects, and if you got near them, you could feel the waves of energy coming off. And if you touched them, you could be healed. That's what she thinks about Jesus' robe in this moment. That if she touches his robe she will be healed. So when she is finally confronted by Jesus, she knows she's already healed. She had hoped to have gone unnoticed, right? Touching his garment had healed her just as she believed. It worked. All I had to do was touch his robe because that thing has divine power. And now I'm good. Jesus reminds her, that's not how it works. That's not what happened in this moment. What did heal her, though? He says her faith. Her faith made her well, even though she had faith in the wrong thing. Her faith made her well. And it's Jesus' response to this interruption in his day. He's going to do another miracle, and this woman stops him. Why on earth would Jesus be bothered with her in this moment? Can't he go help Jairus' daughter and then circle back around to her? His response to this interruption in his day is so, so amazing to me. He didn't push her away, right, when she tried to come near. He didn't, you know, hang up the phone and ignore her or, or just ignore her call because he didn't want to deal with her in that moment. Anybody else ever done that? You get a call and you go, I don't want to talk to them right now. I'm going to ignore that call. Somebody texts you and you don't respond for a while because you don't want to deal with whatever it is that's going on. He didn't go, oh, fine, ask me another question. He welcomed lovingly this interruption in his day. I'm not very good at welcoming interruptions in my day. One of my favorite authors, Henry Nouwen, wrote, my whole life, I've been complaining that my work was constantly interrupted until I discovered that my interruptions were my work. I want to read that one more time because I believe there's a lot of power in that in that statement. My whole life I've been complaining that my work was constantly interrupted. I've done that. I've complained that my work was constantly interrupted until I discovered that my interruptions were my work. And you see how that mindset would change the way you think about interruptions. They stop being interruptions at that point, and they start being, this is the work that I'm here to do. Oh, that we would begin to think like that, like Jesus did. Go figure, right? 
And the second thing, the last thing I want to talk about today, is that I believe Jesus invites us to rise. And here's what I mean by that. After this whole fiasco that we go through with the, the, the unnamed woman who's bleeding, as she touches Jesus' robe and gets healed, we finally arrive at the destination, right? And it's almost, it's, as you're reading along, you get Jairus' daughter, and then you have this long interlude with this woman, and then all of a sudden, these messengers arrive, and you go, oh, oh yeah, Jesus was doing something else in this whole story. You almost kind of forget about it in a way because he, he focuses so much on her that you kind of forget about why he's headed in this direction anyway. This journey was so different, I think, than what Jesus had probably anticipated. But he made it to the destination all the same. I think our spiritual lives are like that as well. Often, we see exactly where we want to go. Spiritually, we're like, okay, I'm headed there. I want better patience, and I know, I know that I'm going to have to be over there to get it. I want better peace in my life. I'm going to have to go that way to get it. I want better love. Whatever it is, we see the destination for us. And then months and, and years later, we finally get there and we go, why did it take so long? And you look back at your spiritual journey on where you've come and you go, oh yeah, it's because it's I got pulled that way for a couple months. And, and then there was this whole couple of years that I went that way. Man, and you look back at your spiritual journey and you realize that the truth is, the journey is, is really what it's all about. The spiritual journey is really what it's all about. And I think that involves these interruptions that I was talking about just a moment ago. So when Jesus does finally arrive at Jairus' house, it's, it's to a weeping family and, and friends, mourners who are just wailing in agony. A 12-year-old girl, girl is dead. So Jesus' presence is no longer required, right? You can't do anything anymore. You may be a miracle worker, but you're not that kind of miracle worker. You may be good, Jesus, but you're not that good. Even you have limitations, or so they think. Instead, what does Jesus do? He goes to work. He informs the family and friends that the little girl isn't dead, that she's just sleeping. I think a lot of people have, uh, understandably, but, but I think mistakenly, uh, tried to say that Jesus here meant that she was only just sleeping, that she was in some sort of coma or something like that, that the people didn't understand uh, that, that she was sleeping, they only thought she was dead. I don't think that's what is going on here at all. I think Jesus is making a very pointed statement when he says she's asleep. Think back to the Gospel of John with me. Jesus says very famously that I am the resurrection and the life. So I think quite literally he believes and knows that everywhere he goes is resurrection and life. So if there's somebody dead around him, they are only sleeping because they're in his presence. Because he is resurrection. This girl is dead. And so what he's communicating, they don't understand. What he's communicating is he is resurrection and they don't get it. Paul says if you are in Christ, you are, you are already a new creation, meaning you have been raised to new life. So when Jesus goes in to see the little girl, he touches her, she comes back to life, but he also tells her to get up or to rise. As I read those words over and over again this week, reading the story, I couldn't help but feel the weight behind them, not only for this little girl, but, but also for me personally, and I think for us as God's people. You see, those words that, that Jesus spoke are the same words that any parent back in Jesus' time would have spoken to their child who was sleeping in late. Neil, you ever told your kids to get up because they're sleeping in too long? There we go. This morning, man, I did not expect that, but there we go. Any other parents ever had to tell your kids, hey, get up, come on, let's go. Now, when you speak those words, 
When you speak those words, get up to your child, do you literally just want them to stand up on their bed and stay right there? Is that what you're really trying to get them to do? What do those words actually mean? Get up and... Yeah! Get up and start doing what you're supposed to do. Right? You need to take a shower? Start showering, right? You need to brush your teeth? Go brush your teeth. You need to eat breakfast? Go eat breakfast. You know, get up has a lot more weight behind it than just stand up. Get up actually means get up and go do something. I think Jesus' words carry the exact same weight. And I think they do for us as well. And so I think the invitation that he gives to the girl to get up isn't just to stand where she is and stay there forever like a statue. To get up and do. And that same invitation is for us as well. We are invited to rise, to get up, not just after our physical death, but right now in our spiritual health. Jesus is inviting us to get up to get up and start moving, to get up and start doing, quit standing around doing nothing. Get up. So that's how we're going to end today. We're going to get up in a moment. A couple of questions to, to end today on. <clears throat> it's kind of a personal question here. Maybe a rough one for you to think about. I think it's important for us to think about. How do you treat the interruptions in your life? Are they a nuisance? Are they bothersome? Are they something you can just... I'm going to leave that for later. Whatever it is, that person, that thing that's going on. How do you treat the interruptions in your life? Or are they a welcome opportunity for you to invest in somebody else to, to show them the, the same sort of love and grace that you've received? You want to show that. I mean, there are lots of ways that you can think about the interruptions in your life. How do you treat the interruptions in your life? And the second thing is, I believe that Jesus invites you and me to rise. Get up. So this morning, my question to you is, what is your response to that? This week, that invitation is given to you. Are you going to get up and start doing? So we're going into our family time right now. <clears throat> our time where we, we call on one another, where we ask one another that, we have something going on in our lives, something that we're happy about, excited about, just we can't wait to tell you what's going on, come tell us about that because we want to rejoice with you. It's also a time that if you need prayers for something that's not going great in your life, it's a time for that as well where we want to pray with you and encourage you and stand with you through whatever storm in your life is going on. So this morning, the invitation is to get up. To start doing, because that's what Jesus is inviting us to do. So if you have a need from your family, from your church family this morning that you want to make known to us, let us know as we stand and sing.